Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minov. And I'm Sean Hughes Kent. Welcome to this edition of Real to Real. St. Charles Seminary, which you see behind us, has graduated thousands of priests in its 150 year history. But Sean, before we talk about the 150 year history and the days they opened those doors, we must also remember that the people of this area were served by mission priests who came from all over the countryside. And it's nice to think how we began as a mission country ourselves. Tonight, we're going to learn about the work of the missions in the past and see how and why they operate today. In many ways, the state of Alaska resembles a mission area because of its wide open spaces and the small number of priests in the area. Therefore, it's the men in the villages as ordained deacons who perform a lot of the parish work. Tonight, we'll meet some of them. In our short subjects, we'll have a remembrance of the late Bishop James Walsh, who was a missionary to China, and we'll introduce a new segment called Do You Know?, which will answer questions you have about your faith. and history of our country is an interesting story and tonight we're going to share with you some of that history the work of the early missionaries and how that affects the work of the propagation of the faith work that continues after 113 years of service to the missions from the moment Columbus discovered the New World the contributions made by Catholics in the years following are the very foundations our church and our faith are thriving on today because the Spanish and French explorers were Catholics, they brought many priests and missionaries with them to the New World. As far back as the early 1500s, a Catholic presence established itself in our country and played an important role in the founding of the American nations. of foreign missions, we conjure up thoughts of places like Bolivia, Bangladesh, Africa, Nicaragua, and San Salvador. It's hard to believe that up until 1913, the United States was considered a foreign mission. John Newman, a humble German priest, came to Philadelphia as a missionary-made bishop to minister to the needs of the immigrants. The conditions that he encountered here during the 1820s to the 1840s were not unlike those that can be found in Bolivia and Africa and other missionary sites today. Only one year after arriving in this country from Bohemia, now called Czechoslovakia, Bishop Newman found himself to be the pastor of what was then called the Niagara Frontier, 900 square miles of swamp and primeval forest in New York and northeastern New Jersey. For the immigrants who came here from Europe seeking religious freedom, it was a trying experience. It took most families two to three years to clear the land for houses and crops, then several more years of exhausting work before their farming was financially rewarding. They lived in small, dark cabins or shanties with little or no furniture. Settlements were often 30 miles apart, and roads were nothing more than rough trails through mountainous terrain or marshy lowlands. Never sure of his transportation, Newman traveled on foot or horseback to these remote settlements to hear confessions and bring Christ to these poor immigrants. He visited the sick and dying, baptized the newborn, and tried to instill faith and fervor into these backsliders. His backpack, filled with vestments and chalice, weighed heavily on the man of small stature as he journeyed more than 53 hours to cover 90 miles. He would spend 20 to 22 hours a day teaching children, celebrating mass, administering the sacraments in unfinished churches before he fell exhausted on a makeshift bed of hay. Newman and a handful of devout missionary priests drove themselves relentlessly but such an enormous effort was necessary to preserve the faith of the thousands of immigrants who were becoming lost to the church because they received no priestly care. In the Delaware Valley, a large number of the early immigrants were German, and one of the obstacles in helping these people was a language barrier. As non-English speaking countries began sending money and missionaries on their own, mission churches began cropping up, 
enabling priests and laity to communicate in a language that they both would understand. One by one, different ethnic groups established their own churches, which today still feel the imprint of their respective heritages. Looking at this quaint church in the shadow of Trenton's Capitol building, it's hard to believe that it was once a mission church established for the early German immigrants. Today, Monsignor Edward Kimmick is pastor of St. Francis Church in Trenton, which still serves the German-American congregation yes, of the Trenton Diocese. Just as we help other countries now, the church here was a fledgling church and apparently would be in need of such funds to help them make their beginnings. Some funds were received from Bishop Newman as far as the establishment of the church. So presumably we think that some monies were received and apparently those monies perhaps came from other places who were giving money to help the young church here in the United States. And it's sort of a nice reciprocity now because I think when it comes to the Society of Propagation of the Faith collection, it seems to be one of the most generous collections that we receive here at St. Francis. All the good things that we often take for granted, like food and clothing and shelter and good hospitals and good schools, okay? So maybe before you go to bed at night, as you pray for your mom and dad and your sisters and brothers, maybe you can remember these poor boys and girls and ask God to help them. Would you do that for me? One of the main vehicles in helping mission churches in other countries and spreading Christianity is through the propagation of the faith. In the Trenton Diocese, the mission office is directed by Father Thomas Malelli. Father Malelli visits schools and churches throughout the diocese, creating an awareness, especially in children, of the need to support and pray for the missions. The propagation of the faith is one of the four pontifical mission aid societies, which means that the Holy Father himself is in charge of the society, and what it attempts to do is to provide funds, provide prayers for the success of the church's missions throughout the world. Generally, we think of missions in such continents as Asia and Africa and Latin America, but while reviewing the expenditures of the propagation of the faith over the past year, I noticed that even a state within our own country, that being uh, Alaska uh, and the Diocese of Fairbanks was the recipients of some of the mission aid which was distributed by the Pontifical Mission Aid Societies. Father John Moran is a Marino priest who has recently returned from missionary work overseas. After spending two years in Bangladesh and ten years in Bolivia, Father shares his experiences and makes us aware of the need to support missionaries like himself. The poverty we experience here in the States is really nothing in comparison to the poverty that we see overseas. There are people, uh, you know, actually starving to death. I mean, statistics say that half of the world uh, is undernourished. Uh, many of these churches are not developed yet. They're not at the stage where they can support themselves. They're not at the stage where they, in turn, can send out missionaries to other countries. So our efforts, mainly in the, uh, in the ideal, uh, the objectives of, of missionary endeavor from the United States, would be to uh, allow these churches to, uh, to help them become mature, help them help themselves. Like, like if everybody around there is poor, like how do they find the food and stuff? Okay, well once again they have to go searching for it. It's not an easy thing. They have boys and girls your own age who never go to school, but who have to constantly help their parents, who actually have to work in order to survive. Just as you pray for your own parents, your brothers and sisters, your grandmom and grandpa, sometimes even people pay, pray for their pets, okay? How about that? How about praying for the boys and girls who are in the missions, who don't have all the good things which you have? Father Moran and Father Malelli have been asked the question, why do we continue to send money and people overseas when there's such a great need in our own country? The economic plight of our own country is certainly one to be concerned about, but we must remember that unless we help one another, no matter how great the distance between us, we fail ourselves. As Christians, it's not an option for us whether we should or should not respond to the temporal, to the spiritual needs of people throughout the world. Rather, it is a command of Christ himself that we go beyond our own borders, that we share the gospel in all its ramifications, in temporal and spiritual needs, whatever it may be, with the people throughout the world. The work of the propagation of the faith and its pontifical affiliates still goes on. 
It is needed as much today as it was needed when our fledgling country first welcomed the missionaries from Europe. Pope John Paul II has said, the missions is not just a generous assistance of rich churches to poor churches, but grace for every church, a condition for renewal, and a fundamental law of life. Coming up next in our short segments, Father Walt Nolan will answer the question, how many times a day can you receive communion in our new Do You Know segment? And in expressions, we will remember the late Bishop James Walsh. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Father Walt Nolan, and welcome to a new segment of our program on Real to Real. Have you ever experienced a situation when you've been asked questions about your Catholic faith and you don't always know the answer? Or maybe there are some questions that you wonder about yourself and feel uncomfortable asking. Well, at times, we've all found ourselves in the same position. Many changes took place in our church after the Second Vatican Council. And for one reason or another, we may not be aware of these changes. So we thought it might be fun and interesting to bring some facts and information that you may not know about your church and call the segment, Do You Know? For instance, do you know that on special occasions such as Christmas, the Easter Vigil, weddings, funerals, and confirmation, you can receive communion more than once? And not eating meat on Fridays never was intended to be eliminated. But because of broad interpretations of the practice of penance after Vatican II, not eating meat on Friday barely exists among Catholics anymore. Do you know that the sacrament known years ago as extreme unction, now called the anointing of the sick, can be received more than once and not necessarily given to people on their deathbed? The priest says prayers asking those who are seriously ill to commend their suffering to our Lord and asking God to make them well. We want to bring you answers to some of the questions the contemporary church is dealing with today. But we want to know what you think and what you want to know. So write to us. Do you know, care of Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. And we will do our best to give you a clear and satisfying answer in this new segment twice a month. Next time, we'll begin by giving you some background on Vatican II and why so many changes occurred after that council in 1962. Thank you for joining us. Good night, and may God bless you. I'm very happy to be free once again. I never thought I would ever see the day of my release. I felt that I would not live long enough to complete my sentence of 20 years and that I would die in prison. Bishop James Walsh was a Marianol missionary to China. In 1958, the Chinese government accused him of espionage and imprisoned him. Even in captivity, he gave his years to the people he loved. Give me your season. And I will take the time Give me your reasons And I will give the rhyme towards those who tried and condemned me. 
I would never feel angry with any Chinese. I felt that way almost from the day I first set foot in China in 1918. Ask me to borrow and I will Bishop Walsh died on July 29, 1981. He belonged to a missionary era that survived warlords and pirates, that withstood hostility and imprisonment, all for the sake of the precious message he carried, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forty-eight years ago, when I came here as a student at St. Charles, it was taken for granted that there will always be a sufficient number of priests to serve the Catholic people of this area. Well, times have changed. And to satisfy that small number of priests we now have in the area, there is one answer, a permanent diaconate program in the dioceses of Trenton, Camden, and Philadelphia. To take a look at another deacon program, we traveled to a diocese in Alaska and saw that there the deacons pretty much work like the missionaries of old. Nelson Island is known by many as having the most unpredictable weather in Alaska. On this island is the village of Tanunuk, with a population of approximately 350 Eskimos. Life is rough in this part of the world. Cost of food, clothing, housing, and gasoline is 15 to 40 percent higher than in the lower 48 and the distances are overwhelming it is these distances and the shortage of priests to minister this vast land that encourage the return of the permanent diaconate program the diocese of fairbanks in northern alaska reinstated the program in 1970 under the guidance of jesuit bishop robert whalen it's a vast diocese 409,000 square miles and uh, outside of the city of Fairbanks there isn't a single community in this area with a population of as much as 5,000. So uh, our people are very much scattered in small villages and uh, it would take uh, quite a force of priests to uh, cover every village adequately so that 
they could have a resident priest in every village. We would look uh, to this program for a means of uh, developing a ministry among the native people uh, in the diocese. I'm sure it will come. I don't know how long it will take. It's been approximately 11 years since the permanent diaconate program was reinstated. A permanent deacon in northern Alaska is chosen by his village parish council and ordained in his lifetime ministry to serve the church. There are currently 27 ordained deacons. Antonunak is very fortunate to have two deacons in service, Mike Anayak, who is an ordained deacon, and Dick Lincoln, who is working toward his ordination. I always feel happy when, when the people see that they understand what the scripture was really about. And years before, they they never see that no one have ever, you know, explained what the scriptures really is. So I was glad that I I am handed to them and great help to them too. The deacons do more than just be spiritual leaders. They help the church in any way possible, from prayer services to picking up the pastor of Tanunak, Father Richard Case, at the airport. Basically, we're stretched very thin with, uh, personally, I have to cover three villages, and so I can't be present to everybody at all, at all times. And with deacons in each of the villages, I'm sure that the people will be ministered to as, they, as best they can. This place can be incredibly pretty and incredibly ugly. community then of Tanunik is really and truly identical with the community of the parish and vice versa, so that uh, all the people share a genuine concern for their life as, as Catholics and as members of Tanunik, the community of Tanunik. And if there's going to be any growth in the community, there's going to be growth in the church here too. And to make sure that the growth of the church is steady and correct, all the deacons meet four times a year for workshops and also attend an annual retreat, this year held in Nyack, Alaska. Here the deacons and their wives get a chance to share ideas, prayer, reflection, and celebrate Mass. Father René Ostruck is in charge of the permanent diaconate program for the diocese. It's a, it's a retreat, uh, three days, during which we sort of uh, review a little bit the work of the year and at the same time replunge ourselves into the message of Christ and see how we can best serve our people through refreshing ourselves and renewing ourselves, hearing the message of Christ once again, perhaps in a, in a more uh, appropriate way. Now we are going to look a little bit closer at the arrest of Jesus and his walk up to Calvary. From the city of Nikuna Tang Kata Hucheli, Maskanikaluku Tang Suku, Unachirisam Tikuarumakatasha, Tonikaling. Somehow the gospel has to be expressed in terms of the thinking and the culture of the Eskimo people. Before I go to the retreat, I was, there's something missing in me. And after I go to the retreat, I come back with something missing, missing thing in me after I come back from Nyack. The task of the deacons in Tanunak is huge since the whole village is Catholic, and Father Case has to minister to three villages, therefore really relying on Dick and Mike's assistance. The 
prayer service would be basically the liturgy of the word followed by a communion service. I think the presence of uh, Mike and Dick in leading the prayer service is what is their primary ministry so far in the village. The people are very appreciative of the, uh, the way that they lead the prayers, give direction to their liturgy, and help the people to grow together as a community of prayer. As far as the uh, uh, changes that are necessary in people's thinking because of the impact of the dominant white culture, those are also uh, going to have to be allowed within the village. But if they're worked out here within the village setting, I think people have a, a chance of developing a good set of values and customs that'll suit them for both cultures. It's been over 10 years since the permanent diaconate program started with the hope of moving the Alaskan church from being a missionary church and moving it toward becoming a native church. And judging from the support that the church is getting from deacons like Dick Lincoln and Mike Anayak, it should be soon that the native church in Alaska will be a reality. You know, Monsignor, living in such an urban area, it's hard to comprehend a state like Alaska where a priest has to be able to fly a plane to serve his diocese. It is a large area, Sean, and it's interesting how both of our stories touched on the same kind of subject matter. One thing, though, we did learn from both these stories is that in the Christian life, there is no room for isolation because the people will be served whether the priest or deacon have to fly there or walk there. Next week, we'll fly down to Jamaica to see how a man uses his business skills to help the poor of that fabled resort island. And we'll take a hard look at the church's just war teaching to see how it stands up in our nuclear age. And we'll get some advice on growing old. We hope you've enjoyed our stories tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next week again on Real to Real. Good night. Well, God bless you now, and good night. <laughs>